Optimal health for high performers. This is the Health Upgrade Podcast with Dr. Nawaz Habib. Hello, fellow upgraders. I'm super excited about our conversation today with Dr. Shalini Bhatt, a really good friend of mine. I went to school with Dr. Shalini at Chiropractic College. Really excited about our conversation because Dr. Shalini has done something really cool. She's been able to marry the idea of functional medicine and the biochemical challenges that go on there with being a chiropractor and the functional movement challenges that we tend to have based on postural issues, based on poor movement patterns and and stuff like that. So let me just do a quick introduction for her and we'll get right into her amazing interview. Dr. Shalini Bhatt is a chiropractor, a double certified functional medicine practitioner with over 10 years of experience in the wellness field. She is the founder of the Movement Boutique, the designer of multiple virtual uh, functional medicine programs and the creator of the Perfect Fit as well as Movement Boutique Fix, uh, a unique treatment method using fascial release movement and acupuncture techniques. Her signature approach to functional medicine focuses largely on teaching. She distills complex information into relatable analogies that you can understand and activate meaningfully for your own body and your own lifestyle. She essentially says, because when you understand why you're doing something, long lasting transformations are attainable. And how true is that? Uh, as you all know from my own story. Without further ado, let's listen in to the amazing interview with Dr. Shalini Bhatt. All right, everybody, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Shalini Bhatt, one of my amazing friends from Cairo School. We were even in our same pod together for uh, a good six months, learning how to work with people and uh, enjoying each other's company during that. So super excited to have you here, Shalini. I'm super excited to be here. And I was thinking about that pod thing this morning too. (laughs) Amazing. So why don't we start off by telling your story a little bit? What were you going through? I remember in Cairo school, there was a lot of stuff that you were experiencing at that time. I'd love to hear you talk about your story, your progression, how you got into functional medicine. Yeah. So, I mean, how I even ended up in Cairo school, my father's a surgeon, my family's from India. So I had this like East meets West kind of view on just medicine in general busted my cartilage in my knee from dancing so much competitively growing up and ended up having you know it was just it was like dad my knee's killing went to the orthopedic surgeon they took the cartilage out like it was just bam 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 there was no like alternatives there was no questions there was no oh how is this moving is it moving improperly what are you doing on it how is the tissue stressed um which we now would ask but uh went for that surgery you know, I remember so clearly the orthopedic surgeon was like, you get the surgery or you have arthritis for the rest of your life and can't like, you know, function. And I was like, these are two dire, you know, I'm 17 years old at this time. And these are two very serious like things. And um, anyway, just got the surgery and went to university, was continuing to dance in university, did kinesiology in university. And then in university, the same thing happened again to my knee, same knee. And that time I had been more exposed to chiropractic and acupuncture and different things that I thought, okay, let me just see what's up. Went to have an MRI. Yes. Cartilage was torn again. Sorry. I should say I didn't fully get it out the first time it was 30%. So yes, there was another tear. And that time I did do it the way that we now know is an option. You know, I mean, I was staying up crazy hours, super stressed, like student life, like all the rest and dancing and just like repeating these movement patterns on no sleep, crappy diet, like all that kind of stuff. So ended up healing it that way. Knee pain went away. I was like, oh, you mean? And then of course in your head, you're like, did I have to have that surgery? Like back in the day, whatever. Anyways, so that kind of led me into, you know, I always wanted to help people. Like, I think you know that about my personality. Like I've just always been that person. And then when I went through university, I wanted to do medicine, but I also didn't like, it didn't jive with me to like write a script and, you know, be done with it. So I'd kind of learned about chiropractic and I was like, wait, you can still be a doctor and diagnose and like not have to just pill for an ill I'm in. Uh, so went to Cairo school. And as you know, you know, in the first couple of years of Cairo school, I would say the whole journey, I honestly look back to that 
four years in such a fog of how the hell I made it out of there. But, you know, you can attest, like I would fall asleep all the time at a drop of a hat. You know, you know, my husband, he would call me the narc attacker because I could just narcoleptically fall asleep. Like I didn't understand how people stayed awake for movies. Like he would turn it on and I would just be out flat. Um, you know, I always had a cold. I feel like I was walking through pyro school with a box of Kleenex all the time. And um, when you and I were in that pod, you know, I actually went to that pod started in January, our clinical rotation year. And I had gone to India in December and I came back and I missed the first three weeks because I got, got pneumonia. And of course you're learning in Cairo school, all these different things. And I remember we learned about rusty sputum and I boarded my plane for India and I was coughing and I'm like, you know, coughing up rust, rusty sputum. I'm like, oh my God, I have pneumonia. And some miracle of the airline, I had my whole bench to myself. Thank God the whole ride home. Anyways, you know, it was just such a, I don't know, I was just like always sick and everything. And on top of that, my main symptom that I had always had kind of since teen years was bloating. And bloating was sort of this underlying thing that now in my practice, I say to people, hey, this is like, you know, people will go to the GP and get the IBS diagnosis, as you very well know, or there just won't be any type of solution offered. So that was sort of my always underlying thing. But then, I mean, I just told you all these layered things. My tissue was obviously um, not in good condition. I kept tearing cartilage and kept, and, and, and by the way, I always thought that back pain was normal. Like I just didn't realize that you didn't have to have back pain. I just thought like, that like, oh, I just have a little bit of pain. Like I didn't realize you didn't have to have pain. I also weirdly didn't realize that you didn't have to be bloated after you ate. Like, I just thought when you eat a meal, that meal just goes there. Like, and so, and that makes, you know, when you're a teenager and you're kind of just, you know, noticing things when you're dancing, you're, there's a lot of attention around the midsection. You get measured a lot for costumes and all that kind of stuff. And um, you're wearing tight clothes. And so you're always aware of what that midsection looks like. So, you know, in my later teen years, it was always a joke with my friends, my food baby, my food baby. Like, you know, I could have, I could have fooled anyone that I was pregnant at any point in time. And so why I'm saying this story is because anybody who's having that kind of like low energy or bloating or what you and I would call subclinical. So subclinical is not enough to push you to the doctor. Sometimes you just kind of think it's normal or it's common or whatever the case may be. So that was kind of my underlying signal of, Hey, something's off. But then I did have those peaks of you know, my cartilage um, tearing, um, the pneumonia, you know, other things that ha had happened along the way, but, you know, often uh, getting colds a lot. Like that is, you guys, that's not normal. Okay. You shouldn't get a cold. Like if someone, like I remember being in our lecture halls, what there's like 170 students. And if someone sneezed, like I would pick it up. Like, so it's not normal to not be able to, you know, battle whatever it is. So that's all to say that bloating and midsection and all that kind of became my, my focus and my theme, because everything that I was being told, eat less calories, work out more. Those were the main messages. And then looking at pictures of women, which, uh, you know, magazines and all that, now it's all social media and stuff like that. But when I was growing up, you know, magazines and TV and all that kind of thing. So seeing all these flat stomachs, I was like, what the heck? Like, why can't I get mine there? And obviously everyone on this call, I'm talking about bloating as if it's aesthetic, but it's also very uncomfortable. So you know, fast forward to, I think when I was seven, 16, I started my first zone diet with very serious. So I was like, you know, that was my first time of like, I think that took like in hindsight. Now it takes out a lot of wheat or processed foods just because you can only have 30 carbs. So 30 carbs, 20 protein and 10 grams of fat. And that's how his meal time is meant to be. So I think just lowering that and br bringing awareness to it and bringing in more veg and bringing in more fiber and color. And I grew up eating healthy, so it wasn't too much of a stretch, but just kind of counting that, figuring it out. That was the first time that my stomach kind of was relaxed, like much less bloated. And so, you know, you go through periods and then of course you fall off because like you're in student life or whatever. But that was my first like, hey, wait a second. There's like an option here. Like this doesn't have to happen. And then... In Cairo school, after that whole pneumonia episode, I was like, someone tell me anything. And a colleague that was going through naturopathic college at the time recommended that, you know, why don't you just try an elimination diet? And I was like, I'm in. Last time I changed my diet, which was zone diet, I was successful. And so I'm in, like, let's do it. Plus during Cairo school, I was living with my parents. So my mom, 
you know, she can make anything. I'm like, yes, <laughs> right? Like, cause as you know, like when you're first learning about it, that's a lot to take on while going to school full time. And this was, by the way, now this is way easier because now it's gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free. Like there's so much stuff and information and everything. I'm talking like, you know, 2008, it was, even though that's not that long ago, like that was a very different time. Like it was like, <laughs> I remember like chicken, plain rice crackers, and then all the veg and, you know, it was, anyways. So did that. And I was like, most energy I've ever had, like top of the world, like, you know, I don't really like the word flat stomach, even though I'm saying that, but like, you know, unbloated or whatever, you know, like I finally felt like me in my body, in my skin. And I was like, wait a second, there's this threshold that exists for me, which I didn't really, my aches and pains were gone. And that just kind of opened my eyes to, oh, wait, there's this whole other level that I like, and, and of course, at that point, when you take an elimination diet, you still don't know, you still haven't done any testing or seen anyone. So I still didn't, you know, know what was going on. So I just kind of kept it going, except still a student and, you know, the reintroduction phase. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of fine for a while. Again, fell off. Anyways, long story short, my uncle way ahead of his time. He's like, I think you need to do a leaky gut test. And I'm like, leaky gut, probably the way everyone thinks of it. Like, are there holes in my gut? Like things are leaking all over the place. So Anyways, fast forward, ended up testing all my stuff. Um, our colleague, uh, Dr. Stephanie Canistrero and I, we did our functional medicine journey together. We did IFM, we did FMU, you know, learning all this stuff for ourselves, being our own experiments, taking all the supplements, doing all the things. And, you know, in hindsight, like, yes, I did have leaky gut. Yes, I had SIBO. Yes, I had parasites and worms and like, you know, adrenal fatigue and like just so many things layered, nutrient deficiencies, like so many things layered on um, one another. I was also living in a very moldy environment at the time, not with my parents, but afterwards. So there were just so many things going on. And, you know, it just goes to show that in that midsection piece, it's not always calories. It's not always working out. And I wasn't someone who had weight to lose necessarily. It just was the proportion and the shape and the feeling and the bloating, like that midsection was just like, so like forcefully pushed out. It was so uncomfortable. So that's kind of why I like to share that. Cause I will see women who come in and they're like, you know, you ask their goal, they're like, oh, I want to lose five pounds. And you're like, what's five pounds? Like, I like, what does that even mean? Right. And, and what they're trying to articulate is that their midsection, like maybe a little bit of love handle or a little puffy, or like, you know, they just, they can't pull their tummy in the way they want to, or after a meal, they're bloated. That's why I think when people say five to 10 pounds, like, like, you know, on a somebody who doesn't need to lose necessarily mass, I think that's what they're trying to communicate. So I really understand when they say that because that was where I was. Like, I didn't need to lose the mass. I just needed this feeling around my midsection to just relax. And so that's where I am now. And with all my history of the muscular, like my tissue and my aches and pains, obviously ended up doing Cairo, did acupuncture as well, which was like also game changer. And then, you know, I kind of marry all of those things in my practice uh, working from gut health from the inside of the body to, oh, I didn't even talk about my movement background, but yeah, I've been teaching Pilates and personal training since like way back, like 16, 17 years now. So that's a huge part of my background as well. And so with the functional movement, with the gut health, and then with the fascial work and the acupuncture, like that's kind of just what my whole practice is all about is kind of really empowering women to be like, it's not actually five pounds that you want to lose. It's feeling better that you want. It's actually that decrease in inflammation. It's being able to digest. It's having that energy. And by the way, you're not broken. This is what you need to do. I love that because your story is, is so parallel to mine. You know, as we were going through Cairo school, how much health issue I was dealing with and the challenges I was experiencing. And even though we were on like appearance wise, completely opposite sides of the spectrum, I weighed 250 pounds, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, borderline diabetic, sweating through my clothes every day as I was treating patients, just not being healthy, not experiencing that optimal health. The parallel is that there were underlying issues that we didn't realize were causing these problems. The root cause of these issues had not been dealt with. We didn't realize that a lot of the symptoms that we were experiencing were actually linked to some specific root cause. And we were able to then 
on our own journeys, funny enough, separated and then kind of got back together through a lot of the functional medicine stuff. We were able to identify what the root causes were, make the changes that were required, and then incorporate a lot of that into the care that we provide to all of these patients, to amazing people that realize that there's something not right. And you're, you're exactly right. A lot of people come in articulating, I just want to lose a bit of weight, or I'm just not feeling exactly right. And not realizing that the symptoms that are underlying are probably linked to things that have been going on for a really long time, that there were stressors that were layered on top of each other. You were dealing with significant gut issues, but at the same time, it was manifesting in physical pain and knee pain and back pain and issues with your tissues. And you were able to bring these two together. I love it because it, it really shows the progression of what comes in through the gut and what actually goes into the body creates the physical environment within the body and how well it functions. And that's where functional medicine and functional movement come in and work together. And that's exactly what you've done to be able to create this, this amazing practice at the Movement Boutique that you have. I still remember when I saw the picture of you uh, Steph and, and Sachin and Deepa at uh, the IFM program. I believe it was in Arizona. You guys had all uh, done it together and I was doing the FMU program uh, online here. And I saw the picture and I was like, I was so excited because I was like, people that I know are finally doing functional medicine. And we were all in that same path. And it was really exciting to me to be able to share that with somebody that I had gone through school with as well. Totally. Tell me a little bit about the the more common challenges that come into your practice you tend to be able to identify both on the physical stressor side and on the biochemical side where we're looking at some of the bloating and the midsection type issues let's talk about what are the common challenges that tend to present in your office and what people can do to identify and and be able to understand what they are yeah so even with my own personal journey i'll say the movement boutique is meant to be a movement in physically moving new types of medicine, new types of treatment, like let's like join the movement, come here, like figure this out because we have so many different facets of how people can start their journey into healing themselves. And why I say that is exactly what you just said, whether someone comes in and they can't quite articulate, I don't feel that well, my back is hurting. And then they might come in, let's say through the musculoskeletal door and they're like oh you fixed my friend's back okay come in so they come in and there's this physical manifestation where their tissues you know are not optimal and you and I because we have this unique lens of working internally and externally you know when you treat someone and then after you're like yeah these tissues like there's some underlying inflammation going on in here like there's something going on so you treat them and then you might suggest hey you know what this is one way we can start to look at things or maybe they'll say you know what while you were treating my back pain you know, also my digestion has been better or I haven't had a headache in two weeks or whatever it is like, because you and I both know, and we talk about this so much that you cannot tease out the body in vivo. It doesn't work. So when you affect change to one area, you also affect in other areas. So we really welcome people to come in through whatever avenue they're at. And let's say that we did treat them musculoskeletally. We might suggest, Hey, you know what you also mentioned you know, your digestion is off or you've been experiencing bloating or that your workouts are making you super tired and not energizing you. Let's now maybe move into doing some functional medicine testing or looking into that route. Or we have people where, you know, we do have a studio in here as well um, with Pilates equipment and we have a virtual studio as well. And people will maybe, they'll be like, I want to get to know these people. And so they'll come and work out with us and they'll realize our workouts are three-dimensional. They're functional. They're very fascial based. Like they feel so much better after moving with us. And then they're like, oh, this was very different. Now, where can I go? So people kind of like can affect change with us through the external or through the internal. Um, you know, we also do facial acupuncture here in our um, brick and mortar space. And I'll say, you know, sometimes we've had people who are like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I just want to like, I just want to look better. Okay, do my face. But as you know, all those points are systemic regulatory points. Those people are zenning out. They are getting acustoned. They are getting so relaxed that they're like, oh my God, what just happened? Like they feel so much better on so many different levels. They came for like evenness in their skin tone or fine lines or something. And then they end up walking out with better digestion or something, you know? So it's just kind of a spider web and we meet people where they're at on which way they want to come in, whether you want to start with testing or start with MSK, um, start with your face, 
uh, or start with the fitness. We, we kind of welcome any avenue and we know we will affect change through any route. It's just at a certain point, we then might direct them to something else. I love that. It's the, it's very much the bringing together of meet them where they're at. And a lot of people are coming in with whatever issue, whether it's physical, biochemical, and they're, they're learning that everything is connected and they're learning that whatever avenue they come in with, they're probably, whatever that challenge is, is probably affecting an, another issue otherwise. And when you address one, you're going to create a change in the other and then the other and then the other, and then we can work towards optimal health when you eliminate these root causes, the things that are causing so many things that are coming out in different avenues. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about fascia. You mentioned it, and I want to make sure that people understand what fascia is. I know you and I have a very clear picture of what it is. And I remember an anatomy lab just going and cutting right through it and then not realizing how important that fascia truly was. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, fascia was a huge role in my journey. I'll say where it kind of started to make sense for me. I, I mean, I'm a dancer, right, from back from background. So when you dance, I know the people on audio can't see me, but like if you hold your arm out like a dancer out to the side, we literally hold everything from our shoulder to our elbow to down to our fingertips and from the neck and you're in that kind of posture. And the thing about fascia, it's all lined up like for a dancer to hold every single position from the neck to the shoulder, to the elbow, to the hand, to kind of all of that you are using that entire fascial sleeve. So it's tiring. So like even in our fitness method, we're only using one to two pound um, weights, but we're using those long levered uh, motions and we're lining everything up. When we do, when we think of gym and fitness, we think of, you know, bicep curls, tricep presses, push-ups, and stuff like that, which is great. And those do work for fascial sleeves and they're necessary and for the different type of training, except for the populations you and I work with when it comes to something like repetitive micro trauma or aberrant posture or, um, you know, some kind of chronic postural, uh, low back pain or whatever the case, you need to look at building up these fascial sleeves and you need to honor that, yes, potentially being on your device and thumbing is what's causing your neck pain because that fascial sleeve goes from the tip of your thumb right into your neck. So what I was saying was with my knee surgery, you know, the whole, it was my medial meniscus and the whole medial side of my leg like right from my pelvis all the way down, like, and my foot was moving in, like ever pronating ever since my surgery. So I'm like, what, like they literally scraped out some tissue. Like, why is this like, you know, this whole length and very visibly. So that was kind of my first, like, okay, wait, there's, you don't just scrape out a cartilage and like, obviously every single, like the fascia, like you and I know goes into that meniscus. Right. So of course, scraping it out is changing how that entire mechanical chain is functioning. So in my practice, I would say like one of the reasons that people might come to us, they'll say, I have a chiro, I have a physio, I have a massage therapist, I've done acupuncture. And I'm like, welcome, come in. <laughs> so, you know, they come in and then we're looking at them from a different lens. So I literally two weeks ago um, was treating somebody and their friend was there and the friend said like, oh, I've already had acupuncture and it didn't work. So I'm going to try an osteopath next time. And I said, the acupuncture needle is simply a tool. And it's like, a, it's like haircutting scissors. If you have a bad haircut, you're not going to never get a haircut again, right? It's who is using the scissors. So the same thing when we step back and somebody who might not have had results with their low back pain for years and years and years, and I look at their foot or I look at their knee or I look at their pelvis or something. And I'm like, oh, this is, we have to address this, right? Back to root cause, what we were saying, right? So um, we really honor those fascial chains and those fascial sleeves in not only assessing, also in treating, but then also in the movements that we suggest. So I think you and I would both agree that the three planes of motion are not acknowledged when it comes to people's rehabilitation. You know, they kind of are like, you know, you go to physio, they're like, oh, external rotation, internal rotation. Like they do these like very silo exercises. Um, but we really try to marry the joints above and below, what that fascial sleeve is trying to do, something that might be tight, something that might be loose. Like we're really trying to look at the entire picture so that we really can affect change at the root cause for that person. It really goes to, to show kind of how you can use movement as a therapy and, and be able to actually create biochemical or even physical changes by the way that you're moving and by the exercises and the actual physical movement that you're you're performing and and 
I think that's a great way to segue into a lot of us are currently and we're we're recording during another lockdown here in Toronto. We're we're working from home and we tend to tend to be working on devices and in postures that are not optimal. A lot of people are sitting there on their laptops, they're sitting there and they're scrunched over, hunched over positions. A lot of people having headaches and significant back pain during this time. I've had a lot of uh, new people coming in and mentioning to me, I've got a massive headache. Oh, and my gut isn't working great right now. Uh, And not realizing that those two are very much connected. I'd love to dig in a little bit into what are some of those postural challenges that you tend to see when people are working in those less than optimal physical positions? Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer that in two seconds because I just realized I didn't even answer your question on what is fascia because you and I skipped it over because we know it so well. So just for people listening, it's a fabric basically that encases um, all your muscles, bones, joints, organs, and so forth. Picture it like a women's nylon running up your arm kind of a thing. And if there's a tear in that nylon, it starts to run the whole way down. So it's kind of that (laughs) just while I put that out there. Um, Or you can think of a steak or an orange and kind of like all that white stuff on the orange. It's all around the orange, then it's around each segment and then it's around each droplet. So just to kind of answer that last question. Okay, to go back to um, this postural question, you are right on the money. So going back to why women might come in with that five pound kind of question, you know, posture is another thing that we look at. So I'd say posture, breathing, and core are three important points and jaw, if we want to go there, um, are are four extremely important points and pelvis and pelvic floor for women, especially postnatal, are extremely important in terms of being able to hold up your spine at whatever tensions you're providing it with. For example, hunching over a computer on Zoom meetings all day. So one of the things we might look at Um, you know, is the TMJ and a lot of women have TMJ issues. So even just looking at the TMJ first, secondly, we'll be looking at their breathing. So do they focus on nasal breathing, which we very much, um, you know, work on over mouth breathing? Are they someone that snores? Are they someone who I, I'm sure you do this in your intakes too. Like I'll be staring at the person and at rest, sometimes their mouth just falls open and you're like, you can just figure that out. They have no idea they're doing it. So that's something you can look at passively in your Zoom meetings while you guys are staring at yourselves anyways. You can see passively while you're listening to someone, does your mouth just naturally fall open? Um, If so, you can make a valiant effort to keep it closed. The other thing that you can try if you can't really remember to keep your lips closed um, is something we practice on tongue positioning. So we teach people how to bring the back of the tongue up to the soft palate it's actually kind of challenging to uh, explain on audio here, but in essence, when your mouth is shut, if you, where, where we should be at is the back of the tongue should be helping the soft palate lift so that we're not excessively using our TMJ. Um, so that's, that's one of the exercises we'll teach. Another thing is nasal patency. So if you don't have great nasal patency, we teach you a little technique to help open your nasal passages. Um, We also, you know, would use if people need like neti pots or rinses or steams or stuff like that to be able to actually get stuff out. We also teach them like stomach two, as you know. So, you know, this stomach two point for those of you listening, it's between it's underneath your pupil and above your smile line, kind of just in your cheeks. And that's like such a nice area to release if anybody has sinus pain, pressure anything like that, but it also helps open the nose. Another one we teach is alternate nostril breathing. Exactly. Which can help you realize that actually the nose is meant to switch nostrils. You know, it, that is a natural occurrence. Um, so don't be surprised if through the day you're like, oh, my left one's blocked, my right one's blocked. But just to make sure you do have nasal patency when you do, you know, before you do something like mouth taping when you're going to go to sleep or something like that, which is another recommendation we would do um, 3M micropore tape. Uh, over the mouth. I always recommend a tiny little slit between it. Just, it makes me feel better, (laughs) but yeah, there's that. And then in terms of the neck, you know, even to, even if we picture someone in bad posture with their belly kind of sticking out, if you get, um, you know, we can all just try this right now. I'll show you guys a quick way to um, engage your core here on audio. If you're in your car or wherever you are, take one hand and place it 
put your two fingers, your peace fingers on the front of your pelvis. So what's called your ASIS in if anybody's an anatomy buff here, then you're going to move medially about one inch and then you're going to move down about half an inch or not even, and then press in as hard as you can with those fingertips. So you can do it with the one side, you can do it with both sides. And then a way to automatically engage your transverse abdominis, which is the deepest core muscle, it automatically comes on when we do a forced exhalation. So what I always get my postpartum women to do to try to reconnect to this is what I call the S breath. So what you do, you take a regular inhale and then on your exhale, you're just gonna go and you're gonna continue that S sound until what I say, you're going to be blue in the face. So you don't want to, like, even when you have any air left and you'll notice at the very end of that S breath, everyone on the call, that muscle will automatically engage underneath your fingers. It'll pop up underneath your fingers. And there you go. Mindlessly, you didn't even need to say, contract my core, do an ab, do a crunch, do this, do that that transverse abdominus will automatically um, start to reappear. So this is amazing if any women out there who've had a baby, they're trying to reconnect with their deep core or their pelvic floor muscles, because this also helps with the pelvic floor muscles. Don't believe me, do the same thing. So put those fingers exactly where we just had them and then lift up the pelvic floor muscles. And you'll notice again, that muscle pops out underneath your fingers. And this is what um, Navaz and I were talking about is those those are all fascially connected. And so as a result, it's contracting without you even having to say contract, right? Um, same thing when we do a di diaphragmatic breath and we're really pulling it on the diaphragm, same thing, those muscles are gonna engage. So that's something you can do passively also on your Zoom calls. So on your Zoom calls, you've got your tongue pressing up, you've got your stomach to point as you're listening, you've got your um, you know, pelvic floor stuff, you've got your transverse abdominis. And then another thing we talk about is that diaphragm, like really being able to expand. You know, You can only take as deep of a breath or I should say, as optimal of a breath as you have the tissue capacity to do so in a mobility and flexible way. So we really repattern breathing because a lot of people from sitting in the Zoom meetings are so tight um, in their neck. And when you're so tight in your neck, there are little deep muscles in the neck called your scaling muscles. And those are accessory muscles that are meant to really, really be last resort. They're not meant to be first resort on a breath. And then because those muscles are kind of, if you picture shortened and spasmed just from sitting, they kind of take over and they're like, oh, I can just do this for the breathing because this is low. It's right here. It's already contracted. No big deal. But then we get the tight shoulders. We get the rounded posture and the rest of it. So what we teach is a three-dimensional diaphragmatic breath. So we might put a band 360 degrees around a woman's rib cage, around the bottom of the rib cage, and we'll say, okay, try to expand in 360 degrees against the band. And then she'll pull the band tight as she's trying to exhale. So that, because people don't even feel like, even when you say low breath or belly breath, you know, even they might take it too low, to be honest, but it's really that bottom of the rib cage that we're trying to expand and to leave the shoulders and the neck alone. So that's another way that we work on the stomach is that when people have either way, by the way, like an arched flared rib cage at the front or the rounded posture, either way is going to change how your belly, well, how your pelvis sits, which will consequently um, change how your belly looks. Right. So if we get the if we get the shoulder girdle on top of the bottom of the rib cage on top of the proper pelvis, then we're talking about a quote unquote flat stomach. Right. If we talk about that pelvis tilting, tilting forward and the, again, the, the rib cage up or down or either way, that's that tummy pouch. So it's these little things you know, practicing your breathing that can change your posture, change how your midsection ends up looking. We talk a lot about breathing um, when I'm working with patients. Obviously, a lot about it in the book, Activate Your Vagus Nerve. Very, very important to be able to understand that how you breathe really does dictate a lot about your overall health. It's not just about the breath itself. And, and not to undermine anything you said, we definitely need to be opening up those bottom lobes of the lung. Too many of us are using those accessory breathing muscles. That's why so many people have these tight neck muscles, upper traps, scalenes, and headaches coming from those challenges. 
and, and neck pain coming from those issues. But when we don't open up those bottom lobes of the lungs, we're not able to. A lot of us have, have trained ourselves to not be able to. And being able to align the from the top right down to the pelvic floor. And even for men, like this is even an important thing for men to be able to do. We, we tend to forget about uh, the pelvic floor if you're a man. Being able to align all three of those creates the optimal scenario for us to then be able to open up the bottom lobes of the lungs and be able to take in way more air than we even thought possible when we do that properly. And then how that engages the core, how that engages the muscles to be able to function at a really optimal level and how our posture negatively affects that when we're sitting there either on our cell phone or on our laptop for however many hours per day on Zoom calls or whatever we're doing. So I love that we're able to to align kind of this is how the physical alignment works. Anything outside of that physical alignment is creating physical stress. And when we're in that physical stress, we're just layering stress on top of other stressors. And how that physical stress then manifests is in the inability to optimally breathe and turning off our vagus nerve, putting us into a sympathetic overdrive state, turning off that parasympathetic anti-inflammatory function of the vagus nerve, allowing inflammation levels to go up and creating a whole biochemical stressor and a biochemical strain. And so I'd love to shift into how we then affect the biochemistry internally by addressing that physical breathing posture and making sure that the breath is optimal, the posture is optimal. Now, what does that mean for biochemistry, for microbiome in the gut? Mm -hmm. So one of the things I, you know, we always talk about is nitrous oxide. So when you're breathing through your nose, you're going to get better vasodilation, which is better oxygen delivery to your tissue. So, you know, we were talking about my tissue patency wasn't great. And I was having repeated injury. We require, you know, well, I should say we would be better off if we could nasal breathe as nicely as our ancestors, because their face shape could accommodate it. Now with, you know, processed foods and softer foods and, um, you know, taking wisdom teeth out and all that kind of stuff, our face alignment is changing and that's changing how much space we have to breathe from our nose, um, let alone all the other crap and pollutants and environments and chemicals and lack of sleep and anyway. But to your point is one of the things biochemically that we'll try to engage people on is that oxygen delivery. So people are working out for the metabolic changes, except without the presence of oxygen, as you very well know, we're going to build up lactic acid when we're making energy. So that makes more soreness, more physical stress to your point. And actually that's something in hindsight that I remember of my own self, maybe when I'm even saying that I was in so many aches and pains, it could be from that, right? So what we, what we try to train people to do is whenever you're doing your workout, is to pay attention and try to do as much nasal breathing as possible. If I walk outside of my house and I like go to the trail nearby, everyone's jogging and their mouths are dangling open and everybody's panting through their mouths. And if you actually try to keep your mouth shut, you'll actually burn fat better <laughs> and more efficiently. So even if you want to talk, you know, you and I are talking about breathing and metabolic changes, like literally make your workout shorter if you have to. Like if you have to drop your mouth open at any point, take a two minute break, start back up again. It was the nasal patency issue. Try some of the things we mentioned. Again, if it was, if it was postural, because that will also affect then work on the breathing first. I literally had a woman in my practice, you know, she'd had three kids and she was ready back training, personal training, this and that, and um, was having this crazy pain. And will, will I ever be better? Will I ever be better? I was like, get in my office and I am repatterning your breathing. I swear to goodness, we made a video and I, what did we do? We did exactly like, you know, all these alignment and breath things and changing this and changing that. And I said, do not do any of your stuff. This is how you're going to breathe. This is how, what we're going to do. And it was, by the way, if you looked at it and we're like, oh, this is Mickey Mouse, right? Like, cause like women want to do planks and abs and crunches and get like all this like stuff back again. And guess what? Like after a week of doing it, She's like, oh my God, my pain is like almost gone. After two weeks, pain was gone. She's like, I didn't think my pain was going to go away. She's like, I can't even tell you how hard it is for me to breathe like that. And I have to mentally like actually like think consciously, right? Because breathing is a subconscious uh, thing. We don't think about how we're breathing. So for her to put the mental effort into that half hour to actually be breathing and doing all this core stuff and different things that we did, 
that it, it's energetically like a lot for your brain. So yeah, from a metabolic standpoint, that's kind of why breathing is so important also from the inside. Yeah. And, and that breath really does dictate so much about what we do internally and, and the in inflammatory reaction that we're going to have when we can't control it. Inflammation is good in the acute scenario. You bump your elbow, you need to get the, the blood flow to the area to repair any damage. But if that inflammation builds and builds and builds and stays there for a chronic period of time, anything longer than it really needs to be there to repair any tissue, it's going to create a negative reaction in our body. It's going to increase or decrease patency of the fascia and actually affect other tissues and create challenges. Oh, my elbow was bumped. Now my shoulder is hurting. Or now I have issues in my wrist and my hand and I have carpal tunnel syndrome and all of these things that are coming up because the inflammation was not managed. And the inflammation management comes from a few different things. We know all about, uh, obviously, vagus nerve being the anti-inflammatory control. But the breath is really how we dictate if vagus nerve is working. And then what are the other challenges that create that inflammatory control? And this is where we can really get into gut function and where the inflammatory cells and the inflammatory challenges can come from. I'd love to dig into that a little bit, into gut health and where the inflammation that uh, we need to control comes from. Yeah, I mean... So one more thing on what you just said that people don't realize, you know, my patients are out buying alkaline water and like all this and that. And I'm like, if you rearrange your breath, you're changing the pH, right? Like we forget that cellular respiration is a big part of pH in our bodies. So fix your breath before buying the, you know, super expensive alkaline water, because that will also alter that acidity. We just talked about that lactic acid as a byproduct, right? So to change that acidic um, state, focus on the breath. What did you just ask me? Gut health. Yeah. Um, so as you know, digestion's happening from the eyes. The minute we see the food, got to put it in, chew it all up to nothing, swallow it. Now, this is where my backstory could come in to play is, you know, you and I, like, I don't want to make everything about gluten, but like you and I know, like when I, that was one of the first foods for me that I noticed, semolina particularly actually, but uh, you know, if you have whatever it is that's irritating your gut lining, you're immediately creating an immune response, number one. So that's going to create inflammation. Number two, it will open the gap junctions between the, in the cell wall and uh, cell wall and the uh, gut lining creating that leaky gut that we talked about, creating more inflammation, allowing toxins and things that shouldn't be um, getting through. And then when we don't digest that, we're potentially creating an environment where, again, we're altering the pH or the digestive enzymes and secretions that are happening. So further allowing this rotting food or whatever uh, to kind of putrefy in our gut. When it doesn't digest, our, um, the valve between our stomach and our small intestine squeezes tighter and doesn't allow that putrefied food through because it's like, what the hell? Like, you're not digested yet. Why am I going to let you through? Except the volume of the food becomes heavier and heavier and heavier. That it just opens the sphincter and allows this food through. When that food gets through, that now needs to be digested in some capacity, which creates an environment for bacterial balances to change. So whatever it is for that particular person from yeasts, funguses, viruses, whatever is happening, maybe they have some heavy metals, some molds, whatever is happening in that small intestine, creating just more inflammation. <laughs> so when those LPS or those inflammatory um, mediators coming off of that process, they need to go somewhere. So they might go to those achy joints you know, knees, shoulders, pains, whatever that person may have. So that's another way that the gut can, and vice versa, when we have, you know, a robust diet and colors and fibers and creating lots of prebiotics and allowing tons of amazing bacteria to feed, we're going to be producing the short chain fatty acids and stuff that are going to create an anti-inflammatory response. And as you very well know, the vagus nerve is so important in peristalsis and the migrating motor complex um, in moving, like physically move bowel movements, people. <laughs> so anybody who's having, you know, constipation as a result as well, I'm sure you, I'm sure you see a ton of constipation as well. 
And so another trick that we um, teach people is an ileocecal valve massage. So that's the valve between the small and large intestine. And um, kind of close by that spot I did earlier, if we want to share this with the um, audience, we can. So if you um, touch your right pelvic bone, your ASIS, the same one we touched earlier, and you kind of, you know, come toward the belly button from that position, make a little middle, middle line. And then you just kind of feel in that area, it'll be about the size of a loony. Yes, I'm Canadian. And um, you'll feel around and you can kind of move up a little or down a little because by individuality, everybody's different. That's not a, you know, one stop spot. Uh, and then if you need it, you'll kind of feel there's a little bit of discomfort right there. Um, and if you are constipated, you want to massage it in a clockwise motion. So I always say clockwise is forward. So you want to get things going. If you're someone more prone to diarrhea or loose stools, then you want to actually massage it in a counterclockwise direction and think anti-clockwise is backwards. So we want to back things up a little bit. Um, so that's another way that, you know, we get in with the fascial release or a biochemical change. I love that. It's such a great exercise, such a simple thing anybody can do. Literally, I was doing it right now and it doesn't show up on a Zoom call. So you can do this. Exactly, guys, I'm giving call. you all the Zoom tricks. <laughs> <laughs> These are great. I know we're running a little bit short on time, so I want to make sure that we uh, address everything. You've got a fun launch coming up and uh, we're going to be sharing all of the details about that on the show notes. So anybody who's interested in uh, learning more about Dr. Shalini Bhatt's upcoming launch, please make sure you check out the show notes. And I'd, I'd love to uh, share just kind of two or three very simple exercises, tips, tricks that anybody can do at this point to help with posture, to help with breathing, and to help with digestion, because all those things are connected and they're not uh, in silos from one another. They They definitely are very much connected. So if you have any that you can share, please let's do that now. I mean, like, let's just review. We just gave you so many amazing ones. So let's just kind of summarize those at the end of this call and put it, that together. So if you are someone who's suffering from bloating, let's say, practice that nasal breathing. Try that mouth taping in the evening. Try that diaphragmatic three-dimensional lower rib cage breath. Uh, try that ileocecal valve massage that we just went over. If you're more prone to constipation, you're going clockwise. If you're more prone to loose stools, you're going anti-clockwise. So those are, those are some things that I would definitely start with. Uh, if you're somebody who's having more kind of neck pains and headaches and upper stuff, maybe check into that TMJ, um, do some, you know, self-release in those areas. Again, we want to get out of that upper scaling breath. So same thing, not only do you want to stretch up there, but you want to work on that uh, lower diaphragmatic breath as well. So those would be kind of like, I mean, we gave a ton in there, but uh, you know, really changing up the breath. And I can't even say enough for nasal breathing. We did talk about that workout hack that I talked about. So if you if you're five minutes into your workout and your mouth is falling open, take a break and come back to it when you can nasal breathe again, because your results um, will be that much more bang for your buck. So even if you only want to work out 20 minutes and take some breaks to get that nasal breathing, that will be major bang for your buck metabolically. I love that you talk about that and, and being able to make sure that you're breathing correctly. I know even in my past, I had that same issue, breathing through the mouth, uh, major challenge. And I mouth tape at night, every night without fail. If I don't, I notice a difference uh, and I feel terrible. And every time I jump on my Peloton as well, I'm making sure to try to focus all of my breath through my nose. So very, very important. And, and keeping in mind, your nose is your breathing hole, your mouth is your eating hole, and where possible, you want to optimize. It's a backup for breathing through your mouth if you need to. But in an optimal scenario, you're breathing through your nose, you're creating that optimal oxygen input, you're humidifying that air in your sinuses, making sure that it's going in and it's telling your body that you're not under stress. It's telling your body to be in a parasympathetic, calm, relaxed, digestive, recovery-based state rather than anything else. And the importance of the breath cannot be un uh, overstated here at all. And that's the thing, like you and I know, because people will come to us and they'll be like, okay, fix me. And like breathing is free. It's so free. It's not even funny how free it is. <laughs> and so sometimes it gets overlooked as a solution because you can't buy it. 
you can't pay for it, right? So I can't even say if you actually put the work in and did it. And by the way, we talked about how we, uh, you know, we want to look for patients. We want to meet them where they're at and bring it in. Fixing your breathing, guys, isn't a dietary strategy. <laughs> but I will give one more tip, and that's this. If you do realize, like once you do start paying attention to your breath and you start becoming conscious of it and you're making your um, mouth shut and you're being aware of it, if you do eat something and you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, I can't breathe through my nose, probably not a good fit food for you. And it's probably that inflammation that um, Navaz and I were talking about. Uh, so maybe something like, you know, it will start to show itself in that way as well. Wonderful. I have one last quick question for you. And I want to bring this up for anybody who wants to perform at a higher level, who really wants to upgrade their, their output and their productivity. When you were able to improve your health challenges, when you upgraded the, the issues that you were experiencing and you came into uh, functional medicine and were able to bring together all of the pieces, what upgrades and output changes did you notice in your own life, in your business, when you were able to really optimize your health? For me, the clarity of thought and being able to focus and not fall asleep at the drop of a hat. So that brain fatigue, like where your brain just shuts down, that that for me was like, you know, Varna. Yes, the digestion in the tummy and the feeling better and after eating and all that kind of stuff was great. But where you can't put like a measure on is the energy. Uh, you know, not waking up feeling exhausted and feel like you need to sleep all day to even just that yeah, that clarity of thought or, you know, less sitting in a lecture hall, like I was mentioning in school, I, I didn't, I honestly, I look back and I'm like, how do people sit here for an hour and a half and pay attention? Like I had no clue. And you and I know, like now we've gone to school also like much since, and I can like sit and listen to a talk and take notes the whole time and be engaged and feel, you know, part of it. Like, whereas that was not a thing for me before. So and this is what your whole podcast is about. If you guys are feeling something that doesn't feel right, or you are a little different than you used to be or something, you're not at a ceiling. It's not because you're older. It's not because it happens to other people. Like you just need to figure it out. And there is, there is more upward motion, no matter who you are. I love it. I, I'm so thankful, so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you here, to share your story, to share some amazing and very simple tips and tricks that anybody can do. These are all free, uh, very simple. You can do them on a Zoom call. I love it. Shall I, I love every conversation we have. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for this again. Where can people find you? Where can people connect with you and, and learn more about what you do? Yeah. So come hang out with me on Instagram. It's, uh, it'll be linked in the show notes, but it's dr.shalinibat. And then uh, you can come hang out with us on the Movement Boutique Instagram. The best way to really hang out with us is we actually give a free, amazing newsletter every single week, every Saturday. People are still like, how do you continue to do this? But I just do it. Like people love it. We have like a 60% open rate, which on a newsletter, you know, is like unheard of. So Really, like, I know who wants to put their email in on someone's, like, homepage, but our content's actually good. Like I say, sign up, and if you hate it, please unsubscribe. Um, but, you know, people have just, like, people have messaged me being like, even just your newsletters, you know, have really changed my game, changed my health. So sign up for that if you want to hang out weekly. Uh, it really is good content. And other than that, we're in Toronto. If we want to do brick and mortar, we're available virtual. Um, we have a virtual studio. You can check it all out on our website. Thank you so much for this again. Of course, all of those links will be in the show notes, including the upcoming uh, amazing program that is going to be launched uh, by the Movement Boutique and Dr. Shalini Bhatt. So thanks again so much. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful day. And thanks for bringing these conversations to everyone. Honored to be here. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.